Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen. Position 19 degrees 14 minutes north, 108 degrees 3 minutes east. Wind light, sky fair. Remarks, cleared port of Haiphong, French Indochina, 9 a.m. After unlogged movement of vessel. Reason for move, the courtship of Anna May Lamour. Port of Haiphong is spread out on the edge of a niche in Asia's coastline called the Gulf of Tonkin. It's a hundred miles south of the designated border between China and French Indochina. It's at one of the seven mouths of the Songkhoi River, and the races that make up its population are as numerous as the fevers that swarm in from the surrounding swamps to reduce that population. But only one member of Haiphong's citizenry was important to us. It was Max Thorne the local representative of my Chinese boss, Kuji Kang. Through him, we were to receive further sailing orders for the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. It was 1.30 p.m. by my wristwatch when we skirted the southern edge of the low, jungle-tufted island called Kak Ba and stood in toward the steaming river mouth. We edged into the welter of native craft outward bound on the ebbing tide... I was so busy at the wheel that I didn't notice until she was alongside the tiny cockle shell of a canoe that had swept across the current to meet us. My chief mate, Gallagher, gave me a call. Hey, Skipper, we got a visitor. What is it, Red? She's, um, immodest, light tan, Micronesian. She's smiling and she don't chew beetle nuts. Tell her we don't want any. Send her back home. Ah, not this one, Skipper. She's already secured to our side and she's asking for Phil Carney. In English. (laughs) When did you say you were in Haiphong, lad? It was too long ago for her to have been waiting for me at the mouth of the river all the time. Bring her aboard, Red. Maybe she's from Thorn. Hey, Nelson, let me a hand with the girl. Okay. Now watch you don't lose your fucking black eyes. Okay, up you come. I have a missive for the hand of Phil Connie. Come on, this is him at the wheel. Here you are, Skipper. I have a missive for the hand of Phil Connie. I didn't know why her young brown face lit up with a smile when I reached out with my left hand for the envelope, but I didn't give her expression another thought after the contents of the note started to sink in. It was from Max Thorne, all right, and it said, The girl will bring you to me. Be cautious. The men you will meet in my office believe that I've sold my loyalty to them. They're from Mr. Kang's enemy, Constantino. Since you're informed of the situation, possibly we can foil their plans, which are, of course, to halt... The Voyage of Your Scarlet Queen. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log and every week a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. The girl led Gallagher and me to a two-story building a few blocks up from the waterfront in the commercial section and left us in front of a narrow doorway. A sign in Chinese characters in English said China Traders, Kang and Son. The narrow under it motioned us up a narrow stairway to the second floor. Uh, remembering at all times to be your own sweet, smiling self, mate? <laughs> After you, Skipper. After you. Uh, Mr. Max Thorne? I'm Max Thorne, and you're Captain Connie. Oh, uh, that's right. This is my chief mate, Mr. Gallagher. Your hand, Captain? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm both happy and proud with your arrival. Come in, gentlemen. I want you to meet some old friends of mine. This is Mr. Cabot Beacon. Uh, Captain Carney's ship is from the States, Cabot. You three should find much in common. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Uh, This is Martin Pine. How are you? I take it you're in the trade, Captain. Yeah, we're looking it over. After the cloak of secrecy Thorne here assumed upon receiving word of your impending arrival, we expected you and your crew to be uh, at least buccaneers. Sorry to disappoint you, Bacon. Working men always do. Oh, you see. Well, Thorne, I I know you'd plan to spend the rest of the afternoon with the captain and his mate. 
But I hope you don't mind if we hold you to your promise of giving us an estimate on our shipment of rubber. Why, no. Business before pleasure. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, so if you don't mind, Captain, we can have our visit later. Yeah, sure, Thorne. Go ahead. We've got some ship business to take care of ourselves. Maybe we'll drop by tomorrow. Good. Uh, I'm sorry, Captain, but you know how it is. Yeah, well, don't worry about us, Thorne. we got plenty of time. Damn, this isn't my style, Skipper. I don't think we should have left. Well, it depends on what Thorne told him, but I think he knows what he's doing. He had a note palmed when he shook my hand. I'm sure a calm customer. Well, we better wait till we get out of sight of the building before we look at it. Yeah. Huh? What do you make of that beacon? He looks like a lawyer. There's no beachcomber, Red. No, I'm sure. The Constantino men are getting smarter the closer we get to Kang's ten million buck prize. All except one. Who? Don't look now, but he thinks he's tailing us. <laughs> That's getting closer to my style. Which one is it? I don't know. I haven't seen him. Oh, I'm awful lucky to have a skipper like you. You're such fun. <laughs> no, I mean it, Red. He's got to be there. Come on, we'll turn here and heave to in the lee of this bully and wait. It's the only way that friendly little huddle up there makes any sense. Haifang Harbor's big. Beacon and Pine want to know where the queen is moored, so they're in the office when we get there. They cut the meeting short, and one of them tails us back to the ship. Doesn't that make sense? If one of them follows us around the corner, then it'll make sense. But Gallagher was rubbing his knuckles, sort of hopefully, when he said it. It was Pine. He swung around the corner and stopped. As though he just remembered something he was supposed to have brought with him. He never did get back after it. Get right back! <laughs> Well, now what do we do with them? Take them back to the ship and keep them out of sight. If they keep coming one at a time, we could clean this thing up this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about Thorne's note, Skipper? Nobody's going to see you read it now. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Well? Oh. What does it say? We aren't doing so good, Red. It says, we'll try to see you on your ship tonight. Meantime, if anybody follows you, do your best to evade him. By no means show our hand by trying to stop him or we lose our advantage. Oh. I guess we should have read it before. Yeah, well, <laughs> anything could have happened to Pine. He could have got uh, run over or something, couldn't he? Sure, Red, anything could have happened to yeah. Pine. I'd feel better if anything else had. We cleaned Pine up a little, held him like he was intoxicated in an erect position between us and trundled him to the Queen. I thought that one twist, like reading the note after we'd had our way with Pine, would be enough for one day, even in Haiphong. The one at the ship was of a different type, but it was just as startling. <laughs> hey, what's all that, Skipper? The after deck of the Queen looked like a Chinese junk on laundry day. Lines were run helter-skelter across the cockpit and back, and they were loaded with underwear, socks, dungarees, and all of it was mine. Gallagher took Pine forward to lock him up in the forepeak. My temper and I went to the cabin. What? What are you doing here? Oh, Phil, Connie. You return with eye of somber fire. What is all this? A cloud on your face dimmed instantly my beaming looks. I became your menial. What's that stuff doing out on deck? It is too dry. That isn't the way I keep my ship. How do you think that looks from shore? It must look most clean. That is a great distinction of lowly lords. The book said that. Hmm? What book? Of a man of your race with the extensive naming of... Robert Louis Stevenson. The book also has extensive naming of the South Seas, a footnote to history. And you read it? From it alone, save a missionary teacher. I learned to read and speak the English. That is why I speak so alluringly. Yeah, I noticed. Now, um, about this washing and stuff, who sent you to do it? My own volition. Mm. I am your menial and companionship. I wish to take care of you. Well, forget it. Where do you come from? My village is upriver. I came here not unwilling to visit like a ghost and be carried like a bale among scenes that had attracted me in youth and health. Yeah, sure. What's your name? I am called Anna May Lamour. I am called that by another of your race who has since returned to my old life of house and sick room. Yeah, that's fine. Now, uh, look, here. I want to pay you for the washing you did. What is that? Well, that's money. Five dollars American. It's worth a lot in the city. I do not want it. 
When I am for a long time your menial and guardian, then you will repay me. Ah, we got a housekeeper, Skipper. And her name is Anna May Lamour. Mm. Look, uh, Lamour, you can't stay here. Where do you want to go? I do not. I've got troubles enough. If you want to help me, you go away. For a brief period of time? Yeah, even that would help. Here, here's the five dollars, Red. Yeah. Take her up to town, will you? Take oh. her where she wants to go and lose her. Oh, you're hurting her feelings, Skipper. And she hurt mine. Laundry. <laughs> when the time comes that I can't do my own washing, I'll find a farm and, and, and a wife someplace. I cleared the mess off the deck and went back into the cabin to worry about my major problem. I knew that the orders I was supposed to get from Thorne would be directions that would lead to a meeting with Kang himself. But the next port, whatever it was, was probably the most important one on the voyage. When Gallagher came back without Lemur, we worried together about whether we'd fouled the deal by jumping pine. We worried until nine that night. And then we heaved two sighs of relief and stopped. Thorne came into the cabin. He looked excited and nervous. Oh, Captain Carney, what happened with Pine? Pine? Well, we, uh, we were either too cautious or not cautious enough. We caught him tailing us before we read your note. Now, sit down. Oh, on. believe me, gentlemen, our, our situation was on the verge of complete collapse. Luckily, I was able to contact a friend of mine with the local police who told Cabot that Pine had been arrested for drunkenness and violence. We'll have to cooperate more closely from now on. From now on? Can't we clean this up and get out of here? Didn't you bring the orders from Kang? The verbal orders he gave me a few days ago when he was here, yes. Uh, the sealed envelope, uh, I'm sorry, but it was too risky. I think I can get that to you tomorrow. You understand? Well, what about the verbal orders? Uh, listen closely. There are a number of addresses. At 437 Napoleon Road, there's diving equipment. You are to pick it diving up. Diving equipment, huh? 437, I got it. At 488 Avalar, there are three boxes for you. They're marked paint stores, but they actually carry dynamite. Diving equipment and dynamite, all right. And Mr. Kang suggested that you replenish and repair the arms you carry and lay on a good supply of ammunition. Well, this sounds like a happy party, don't it? Now, do you want me to repeat them for you? Hmm? No. No, I think I got everything. Red. Huh? Count one and come out on deck with me. This ship is adrift. What? Uh, skipper. Why dissipate time and trouble, Captain. my stupid buccaneer? What's with the ship, Beacon? You cut her adrift? Why? It might be to sink it, Captain. Well. What do you think of that, Red? I think that it would be a shame to sink the ship. Gallagher knew what I meant. Beacon had walked into the cabin unarmed. He was well built but slim. He wore rimless glasses. Gallagher prowled around behind him to hit him from the low point. I started moving in from the front. Beacon looked like he was in the middle of a ballroom as we moved in. He took his glasses off. And Gallagher hit him first. And he didn't get up. Gallagher, I mean. Then before he turned away from Red, I made my rush. With my right arm over his shoulder as a pivot for the cartwheel, my feet flew up and I landed athwart my desk and rolled off. His judo throw had made my right arm useless. I tried to get up, but he walked calmly over to me and just as calmly sapped me behind the ear. Hey, what? What? Hey. Hey, Skipper. Come on. Come on, wake up. Come on, Skipper. Come out of it. All right, lay off, Red. My head aches. Yeah, I wouldn't wonder. I never saw anybody slugged as many times as you were in one night. On me, he didn't use the sap. Huh? But that don't mean he didn't hit me. Right there. Ow. Between my neck and my shoulder. And when he got through, I couldn't move my arms. What's that guy got, Skipper? Brains red and a good judo teacher someplace. <laughs> Ooh. They moved the ship. Where are we? We're up one of the Sunkoi channels, moored to a mud bank in a blasted jungle. Beacon brought some Indians aboard to bring us around. Our crew? Oh, you know, they're locked in the focus room, but I think they're all right. Yeah. Thorn? You know, we got troubles enough of our own, Skipper. They kill him, Red? Oh, after that double cross? I don't know, Skipper, but it was a dark trip, and he isn't here, is he? Where's Beacon? He left right after we got here. In Pine, they found him, too. 
All they left to watch us is a whole blasted tribe of Indians squatting all over the deck. Listen to them. I wonder what that is. Beacon and his crew coming back, or, or those cannibals have got their stew pot boiling for us. <laughs> Take your choice. Lamore. Oh, no. Never mind, Skipper. Say something to her. Bill Carney? Yes, Lamore. I am, as before, your menial and guardian. You wish to reward me? Can you get us out of here, Lamore? Only you, Phil Carney? Hey, well, wait, wait a minute. Wait. I have looked forth with enticing eyes at the leader of the guards. He accepts you as my charge. If you will but accept me as your menial and comradeship, he will allow us to vanish together. What are you waiting for, Skipper? All right, Lamore. With the memory that I wash your clothes and yet now save your life? Yes, Lamore. You owe me great debt. I return forthwith your five dollars. Come, my lord, we will vanish. <laughs> I made a lousy lord, but I tried my best because it was better than being cooped up on my own ship. There was no doubt of one thing. Her service was good. We got into a narrow dugout canoe. She paddled us a few miles downstream. When we beached, I could make out the faint trace of a road leading through the jungle. Like magic, a wagon pulled out of the brush. There was a short, chattering conversation between Lemur and the driver, who looked at me appraisingly, then nodded. She and I got into the wagon and left. And an hour and a half later, we stopped in front of Max Thorne's office. My lord has business in this place? I wish I knew you better, Lamour. I wish I knew how smart you were or, or how stupid and how much you know or how much you don't know. You already owe me a great debt, my lord. But perhaps I will help you further. You will go into the office now? I will, hmm? Okay, Lamour. Anything you say. The experts have said that the native mind is simple but impenetrable. At that point, I wasn't sure of the first half, but I was convinced of the second. I waited outside the office door for a half a dozen breaths, listening. There was no sound, and there wasn't any light coming from under the door when I bent down to look. It was unlocked. I pushed it open suddenly, jumped back to hug the wall, and waited some more. Then I walked in. I found the light switch and snapped it on. No one was there, but someone had been. The place had been torn to pieces. I didn't go to much trouble in my own search for the sealed envelope Thorne had told me about. The one who'd searched before me had done about all there was to do. I fumbled through some of the junk that had been dumped in the desk drawers. I was just moving toward an overturned file cabinet when I heard the floor creak under a shoe behind me. What? Following an outthrust automatic into the room was Cabot Beacon. And following him, more alive than I was, was Max Thorne. Well, Captain, you've gone to a lot of trouble here in the office looking for a non-existent sealed envelope. Wait a minute, Thorne. Whose side are you on? Oh, to be quite candid, I found the Constantino money irresistible. I had no idea he was so interested in Kang's $10 million secret. He threw his money away on you. In a sense, I agree with you, Carney. You were stupid to trust that girl, Thorne. But as our arrival must reveal to you, Captain Carney, there are also informers working against her. We haven't failed yet, nor are we likely to. What have you gained, Beacon? What was this fancy double cross you were passing around? That was my idea, Carney. And rather good, I think. You're overeducated, Beacon. Sufficiently, Carney. Is it possible that you don't know what Constantino wants? Know what he wants? I've been bucking him all the way from San Francisco for what he wants. I don't know where Kang's prize is, so there's no way you can sweat it out of me. It's like this, Captain. My orders from Constantino were only to stop you. So that he will have time to plan new strategies while Kang finds someone to take your place. You are stopped. Your ship, hidden in the jungle, will stay there to be dismantled and scuttled. Yes, but there is one way out, Captain. Yeah, I know. The one you took, Thorne. You don't need to bother with it. You're an odd man, Connie. I'm a bad loser. When somebody outsmarts me, I never get rid of the urge to kick him around. I'd kill you the first time either one of you turned your back on me. You're really quite picturesque, Carney, aren't you? Yes, it's too bad you feel that way, Connie. Yeah, I know. I lost a lot of friends that way. 
Don't try anything, Connie. Where are you going? Let him go, Thorne. But on his first attempt at anything, shoot him. Don't worry about me. Feel like moving around? Feel free to do anything you like, Connie. Thanks. What I'm really doing is holding your attention like Thorne held mine while you were slipping the moorings on a Scarlet Queen. So somebody can sneak up behind you. I did overestimate you, didn't I? <laughs> ah, it isn't that. You're just too intelligent to fall for an old gag like that. Even when it isn't a gag. This one, Lamore, I'll take Thorne. Don't react, Thorne. It's a stupid... Ah! They didn't believe me even when I shouted at her. I had more respect for Beacon's judo than for the 45, but he went down like a dead man under her blow, and I had Thorne off balance from the surprise. He pulled the trigger twice in desperation, but the slugs just chipped the ceiling. He relaxed when I hit him and lay next to Beacon. I looked at Lemur. She was leaning on her war club, leaning over Beacon. It was only a stake from the wagon, but the stealth of her movement up the stairs, across the hall, and into the room had been pure, beautiful savagery. This one is no longer dangerous? You clubbed him well, Lemur. He's entirely drained of danger. I have been your salvation again. Have I indeed not, my lord? Yeah, I'm afraid you have, Lamore. You would have reached quickly the end of your span of years if I had not arrived so vigorously. But I have a feeling of concern lest I cannot always arrive. What do you mean? I have brought to you yet your constant ally before me. Wait a minute. You don't mean you've brought... Gal Gal Quit shoving, quit shoving, will you? I'm getting there as fast as I can. Rad, Skipper. Hey, Skipper, what's going on? Who's that, Beacon and Thorn? Yeah. How'd you get here, Red? Well, it seems I got a friend in that tribe, too, but he's old and ugly, and he don't talk like yours does. How'd you come, Red? And the queen. The queen? Yeah. Right after you left, the Indians hoisted anchor, and we come around. She's lying in her berth now. She all right? Oh, nothing worse than a few tree branches following a rigging. Yeah. Uh. I'm telling you, Red, this one has I been the... I looked forth with enticing eyes upon the leader Yeah, I of... know. You talked them into bringing the ship around. Indeed, I did just that. Mm -hmm. When you are prepared and rested and ready for travel, we will proceed to your ship. Okay. You heard what the boss said, Gallagher? <laughs> boss? <laughs> I thought she was your slave. Things have changed, mate. <laughs> Things have changed. If I could have found anything to complain about with the way things had gone, it would have been the way my debt to her had developed. That, the fact that there had to be a payoff, and the fond look in her eye that gave me a hint of what kind of a payoff it would be. She held my left wrist with a new possessive touch all the way to the ship. She was still holding it when we all went into the cabin. Phil Carney. Your debt to me has grown like a palm tree. It now transitions to a mountain. With the message I derived from the envelope I found in the office of Max Thorne. You? Certain instructions from some man named Kuchi Kang. What? You... Some man named Kuchi Kang? Lamour, that's the only reason I came to High Fund, to get instructions from Kang. What are they? Remembering that I and me alone give them to you. I say yet, you will fail to Singapore... You will find Kuchi Kang in room 207 in the Metropole Hotel. Is that not stunning? Yeah. In your country, you are forced to pay all debts. Well, in my country, we seldom have debts like this one. But look, Lamour... You are I... a splendid man. Yeah, but really, Lamour, uh... Well, you're not cut out to be a menial... You, you ought to marry some fine, strong man from your own people. I know what I owe you and how you feel about things like this. How did you and learn so of I my don't... marriage? You... You're planning on marriage? To someone you know? He is tall and fine. And I will teach him to speak as I speak. Oh. You don't want to be my... Menial and comrade, whatever it was. I wish now to end my service to you. It has been very great. Mm-hmm. You perhaps wish to repay me? Anything I have, Lamar. Uh-uh. 
Watch it, Skipper. From the beginning, I have greatly admired that which you wear on your left wrist. Hmm? It is of shining brilliance, and its tick-tock, tick-tock would lull my future My children. wristwatch? You mean you've done all this for my wristwatch? Indeed, yes. How could I have hoped for its attainment if they had killed you and the watch were carried down the river with your body? <laughs> Phil Connie, the great lover. <laughs> yeah. Here's the watch, Anna Mae Lamour. <laughs> By nine the next morning, we'd cast off and threaded our way through the downriver traffic. We picked up the deep water swell and the breath of the trades when we skirted the southern rim of Cock Bar. Stand by to make sail! The men were glad to feel a fresh breeze after the listless heat of Haiphong. They scrambled to their stations to hurry us out where the winds were even fresher and cooler. Let's port, sheep! Make sail! big sweep of the mainsail unfolded, filled, pulled the mast over into a bow to the power of wind and sail. the jump sheets, men! Smartly now! The jibs ran out. The big mizzen boom swung over my head. And the Scarlet Queen fought at the water of Tonkin Bay with her bow and left it churned and beaten in her wake. Oh, she all right, Skipper? Sail's right, Reg. Good. Stay Good. like this all the way to Singapore and I'd like it. So we're finally going to meet your boat. That's the word. I got a few things to say to him myself. Ah, uh, you'll like him, Reg. <laughs> yeah, I'd better. After what I've been through for him. Huh? Don't you like your work, Red? Well, I was just thinking. What's going to happen when we run into something like that Haiphong rat race and you don't have a watch to make some poor little Indian girl think you're worth saving? I felt that one coming, Red. (laughs) And you. (laughs) Afraid you were breaking heart. (laughs) Oh, you better have a drink, Skipper. (laughs) Yeah, for my injured male vanity, huh? (laughs) After you, mate, after you. Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 11.30 p.m. Miles traveled from San Francisco, 11,658. Sky fair, wind rising. Mainsail and mizzen reefed. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, Master. Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.